Uh, yeah, as I said to you, I'm, I'm looking and the release manager for Susie Deep. I'm getting paid for that. I work for Susie in quite some time actually. So, um, why am I here? Well, Susie has been around for more than 25 years now. And uh, the veterans among you probably know Susie from former times. We have been a KDE distribution right from the start and for a long time. KDE was actually defaulting in SUSE, SUSE employed lots of KDE developers, but times changed. At some point, SUSE decided to go for GNOME as a default for the enterprise distributions. Nevertheless, KDE always kept its place in SUSE, in OpenSUSE, and OpenSUSE kept having KDE as default even. Also OpenSUSE changed over time, so we have this OpenSUSE releases that were snapshots from, from factory back then every year. And that model changed, so now we have two distributions. And now I'm here to tell you about the two we have now, because maybe I'm not aware of the changes in our community. So we have two now. One of them is Tumbleweed, the rolling release distribution, and the other one is Leap, that's what I'm responsible for, that is the stable distribution. So Tumbleweed being a rolling release distribution always has the, the latest and greatest of everything, of course. You get new versions every day. That, that's normal for any rolling distribution, I would say. So what's the cool thing there? Well, we have kind of a CI on operating system level. So we're not just dumping new versions of packages on our users, but there's actually a automatic PA system involved there that makes sure that there's always some base quality achieved so your system never breaks. Um, yeah, Tumbleweed has around 50,000 users meanwhile, so it's nicely growing. On the other side we have Leap, the stable release distribution um, based on the SUSE Linux Enterprise server sources. Normally we get maintenance updates, so it doesn't change much during the year. And then every year we have a minor version, kind of a service pack that gets more features. Overall, if you follow all the maintenance uh, and service packs, you get more than three years of maintenance in total. So the current release, um, called to a three, was just extended with the maintenance. So we are now at 44 months actually, actually from the start. Oops. And Leap has about 200,000 users. In total we have even more, so there's a long tail of users that keep, keep using old OpenSUSE versions. Okay, so based on those uh, facts, both distributions are obviously for different target audiences. So yesterday someone asked me which one is better, Tumbleweed or Leap. Well, there is no such generic answer because they target different user groups. Tumbleweed, having the latest and greatest stuff, is uh, more for developers for contributors of both OpenSUSE and also upstream because we're very close there. And of course for power users that just like to have the latest of everything. Leap on the other side, being more conservative, um, is suitable for production use. It's attractive to software and hardware vendors actually. For example, the Slimbo guys, they want to put Leap on their systems and they ship it to users. And that's all the users of course. We ourselves don't really target users in OpenSUSE ourselves, I would say, but those who deploy Leap, they have users on their hands, so they target Leap as users. So let's talk about the common features we have in OpenSUSE, because you may not be aware of them anymore. Those are Linux operating systems, they are general purpose, so we are not doing OpenSUSE for a specific use case. We can't say this is a container distribution or this is an embedded distribution, no. Ours is pretty generic. It scales from the small Raspberry Pi up to huge data centers, basically. And we do all of that based on RPM. After RPM is our package manager, for better or worse. I guess we will never change that. That is our technology. But that doesn't mean it's bad. We actually have packaging policies there. So we don't just take a tower and put one big RPM. But we have um, the shared library packaging policy, for example. So Packages are split up in smaller chunks, so you can actually build very small systems or systems that contain everything, including documentation, include development files. All that is possible with RPM. 
What's also worth noting is that OpenSUSE is self-hosted and reproducible. That means everything you see in the OpenSUSE build service as sources is actually used to build OpenSUSE. There's no external components that were magically used to build the packages there, but everything in there was used to build themselves. So the GCC there built the GFC and GFC was used for GCC, for example. All of that is source-based. So in some distributions, developers upload binary packages, for example. That is not the case for us. In our development process, the, the packager always has to upload the sources and then file a submit request. That's similar to the development process on GitHub, for example, where you file pull requests. Those requests are then reviewed as a source review, both automated tools as well as a human review. And only if those reviews pass, the pops up they get into the main web form. And then it's rebuilt there on server side. That process is open to anyone. You just need an OBS account. That means basically an email address. There's no procedure to follow. You don't need to be a member of anything. You don't need to sign on CLA. You can just sign up in the OpenSUSE build service and start uh, contributing there. Yeah, let's talk about um, how we can deliver the operating systems. We have the traditional installation that you maybe know, the Yast. So you put it on a USB stick, plug it in your laptop, and uh, do a manual installation with the traditional one. But you also can do mass deployments, for example, using AudioYast. So the installer can record all your actions, save it as XML file, and later you can do another installation, pixie boot it, then replace the installation with a different system. And you can scale it up, of course, to, to a huge mass deployment. You can also use this method to create preloads, for example. So there's an OEM installer that's called Yast First Boot Wizard. So when the system boots up the first time, it would ask for root password, for username, for keyboard language. That is also possible, useful for um, guys like the Slimbo guys to preload laptops. We have uh, live images. That's more interesting for end users, I would say. So if you want to try it, OpenSUSE works on your system, you can download the live image and try that. We have them both for KDE and GNOME. And you can use the live images also to start an installation. And on top of that, there are also virtual machine images for KVM, for VMware, whatever VM technology you need. We have containers, and the loop is also in this Windows subsystem for Linux, which is quite popular, I heard. And if that's not enough for you, there's Kiwi, and Kiwi is a technology for building your own custom images. So you can assemble with those RPMs, your own flavor of the distribution if you need that. And you can also upload that to OBS and use the build service to build your client or custom installer. Okay, back to Tumbleweed. As I said, it's a fully rolling distribution. That means Tumbleweed doesn't just update some components, like we have the, the latest KDE for the Nordic kernel. No, that is not the case. Tumbleweed always updates everything. No exceptions. All the 11,000 source packages it has get updated. Hundreds per day all integrated together every day. And this is enormous, the, the, the power behind that, what we change there every day. And um, to make sure it doesn't break, we have those automated tests using OpenKA. I was surprised to hear about that in another talk already today. And if you want to know more about that, um, I suggest to go to the distribution spot where Fabian um, will talk about that a bit more. So the, those automated tests make sure that the system always comes up into some defined state. So we know the kernel boots, we know the bootloader works, we know that systemd didn't uh, break the system somehow, we know that X can start a query, we know that KDE can log in your user, we know that we can start Firefox. If the installation that you did that doesn't work for you, then it's most likely some hardware issue or some local issue. But we know that the distribution in general works. And whatever happens, we normally always have network, for example, to fix your stuff. And if it still fails for you, we can do a uh, rollback. So what's built into both distributions is um, the Snapper tool. Snapper works on ButterFS, which is the default file system for us. So whenever you install a package or you do a distribution upgrade or you just do a maintenance uh, update or security update, Snapper will take a snapshot of your system, then install the package, then take another snapshot. So if that installation fails for whatever reason, or your system breaks after it, you 
and just snap a roll back, reboot, you're back on the old state, and can we call a bug or try to recover from that, skip a snapshot, it's pretty quick. Um, yeah, Tumbleweed is available for x86 and x86-64 as primary architectures, and there are also community ports to ARM, AI64, PowerPC64, and SV90. Those are not as much tested, and they're um, mainly there because Tumbleweed is the base for the next Linux enterprise. So they are already testing ahead of time what's coming up there. That also makes Tumbleweed kind of interesting because you can both see what's coming there in the, in the Linux world, and you can also influence it. So if you put stuff in Tumbleweed, there is a chance that it just flows into a Linux enterprise server in the future. And what does that mean for KDE? Yeah, you get always the latest Linux technology to, to develop against. So you have a, a new kernel, you have the latest systemd, you have the latest X, Wayland, whatever you need there, Qt. Always the latest environment. Your releases are shipped pretty quickly, usually the next day of the release, if you coordinate the release management a bit. So Tumbleweed is really great for cool new stuff. Its users are looking for that new stuff. They want that. And if there are any issues, they can and will be fixed quickly because developers use that system. So whenever something breaks, they are interested to get that fixed as quick as possible. Because it's rolling, the fix will be there the next day. And as I said, easy recovery. So whenever the CI failed and didn't cover your use case, you can always roll back, skip a few snapshots, and then get the fix for the next one. OK, so much for the tumbleweed. Let's talk about Leap. Leap is the stable one. The base system there is from SUSE Linux Enterprise. What does base system mean? That is basically anything up to GNOME. So the kernel is from SLE, systemd, glibc, gcc, x, and the GNOME environment, including Qt, because that is for, used for us. All the rest, that also means KDE is taken from Tumbleweed at the time of release, so Leap will not uh, keep getting updates from Tumbleweed on those components, but take the ones that are basically there to release today and stay with that. And the release is frozen, so to say, on the major version. And um, then we get maintenance updates, so we only want to have bug fixes in the release to not break or introduce other surprises to users. Um, over time, there are yearly minor versions, as I said, kind of service pack level updates. And uh, Leap is available for x 64 with ports to ARM and AX64. So there's also a Raspberry Pi V image, for example. Again, um, minor versions are service pack like upgrades. So they may introduce some features, but they are not a complete rebase on Tumbleweed. Coming from SLE, the current workflow kind of is that every other minor version of the service pack is a, a bigger one. So right now we released 15.0, and we'll have 15.1 next year. That would be a rather small one, just consideration, some bug fixes that couldn't get into the dot zero one. And then the next one, dot two, is probably a bigger one that adds more features. But even if those service packs add new features, the condition always is that there are painless updates. So we want our users to follow the service packs, so they need to do that easily, so we don't want service packs to break. So whenever there's a new feature, a new version of something in a service pack, there needs to be an upgrade file. Users shouldn't get stuck there. What does it mean for KDE? Less is more. So we rather have one or two really cool features that are really stable, mature, and work for the users, rather than 10 that are just shiny, but then turn out to be annoying. Uh, yeah, you need to keep in mind that we can't upgrade random components. So even if you think, okay, let's just put in this new Python module, for example, that looks harmless to you, but actually in those 11,000 source packages, there may be 100 that also you need that Python module, but in an older version. So you have to integrate all of that. So there are compromises, and either we upgrade all those 100, or at least check them, which is also effort, or we don't. And normally, we don't have infinite resources, the default is uh, don't upgrade, just be conservative and don't do that. But as I said, some upgrades are possible after two years, so when there's a bigger service pack, there's also a chance uh, to introduce new features. So in, in 12, in 3.12, and 
that would equal to the upgraded Q, for example, in, in that respect too. And with that, we got a KDE version. What else? I wanted to mention translations. So developers tend to not see other languages. So I'm guilty myself. If I look at the screen and it's in English or in German, I, I don't see the difference normally, unless I'm, I'm really looking for it. But for stable release, it's important. There are users that are not that familiar with English, and we need the translations there. For the developers, um, Leap is also attractive to the develop for the LTS version, for example, because not all developers also want the latest and greatest kernel and system D, and maybe are more interested in LTS versions that are used by users, so Leap is the better base for that, I would say. Yeah, so let's talk about what we have right now. Right now we have two Leap versions for the maintenance. One is 4203, was released uh, last year and lives until June next year, so the maintenance was just extended for that. It has Q5.6 and Plasma 5.8, and uh, currently the 15.0 was released just a few months ago in May, and it maintained until November next year. It has Q5.9 and Plasma 5.12. Um, speaking of that, I don't even know what kind of KD applications or frameworks are in there, because um, that just that is not in my mind, so <laughs> if it was for me, please just call that thing KDE and put a version number and it would be completely fine. I don't really know what the other stuff is. And so the distro version went backwards? Uh, yes, the distro version went backwards, yeah. But there's only the user visible part, so the, the RPM markers and all that, they're still incremental. There's a special story about all of that, so yeah, let's have a beer about that. It's not the topic of this talk. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll talk about Leap. Next year we will have 15.1, most likely around the same time as uh, this one, so maybe May. I don't expect major changes, even though I haven't talked about it much, so I would say also the same Q, same Plasma as before. And after that, no concrete plans about 15.2, but I would expect it 2020. And since the pattern was yeah, bigger updates in every other service pack, I guess that the SUSE Linux Enterprise base will do some upgrades, mainly for hardware enablement, so that would be, for example, kernel system DX and maybe also Qt, but we don't know yet. The good thing is, there's an in, we have an influence there, so if you as KDE community have an opinion there, what you should do with KDE, if you need a new Qt version, then let's talk about that in advance, so we can coordinate with the three guys. On the other side, if I get to know the three plans, I will approach you and uh, let you know what's coming, so we also know if they're going for a new Qt version or not. In any case, by default, I would prefer less changes, so I wouldn't actually upgrade the FKD LTS version in Leap, I would prefer to have the same version over the full lifetime, ideally, because it's just less surprising to users. Always keep in mind that there are also training costs attached to upgrading a desktop environment, so better stay with the old version and don't get the users confused because some item changed. Um, one more thing, through the package shop, it's not really an open source distribution, but this is the community packages from open source built for SUSE Linux Enterprise, so that is the bridge into the enterprise world. With Leap 15, we are very closely aligned, so in the same way as Leap uses the same case as SLE, SLE now can offer the, the remaining packages from Leap for SLE. So that is how KDE gets into SLE again. So even though SUSE has GNOME by default, supports GNOME, it doesn't support KDE. The users of SUSE Linux Enterprise can go there, officially enable the package hub channel and get KDE there. So someone else could support KDE on SLE, SUSE doesn't care. That is a big chance that KDE has there. So we close the, the cycle, SUSE Enterprise, Leap, Package Hub. Yeah, to summarize, we have offerings for both developers and also for production use. It's a friendly environment. We actually like KDE. There are still lots of friends in SUSE that like KDE, that are former KDE contributors or still contributed to KDE. There are many, many employees in SUSE that use KDE actually despite a different default. 
and the base system is backed by the company, both in Tumbleweed as well as in, in Leap. That's a big chance because there's always an interest to get that fixed and not just let it rot or go away in, in some way. So this has been around since 25, since 25 years and I hope it will last another 25 years so we're here to stay. So yeah, let's make KD shine out in Susan. That's it from my side. Any questions? How do you how do you feel about open SUSE derivatives that exist outside of open SUSE? For instance, gecko vendors. I don't know that one. But my recommendation would always be to get as much as possible into the main distribution. Because only that way it's on our radar. I mean seriously. For example, a few years ago I talked with the, the packager from New Health. He was complaining that it breaks whatever release he has to take care of adjusting it. And then we just helped him to get the packages into the distribution. That way they stay on the radar of release management. We know if there's some update of I know some Ruby gem, we know that GNU has is going to break. Just made up example, I know to give us food, gems. Um, so that way we can notify him in advance and people will help him actually to, to fix the package if it breaks. So if you do some flavor, some spin of OpenSUSE, I would recommend always get your changes into the main distribution and keep your diff as low as possible. There's some uh, KDE repos uh, available on um, download.opensuse.org um, for KDE upgrades uh, available for you. Uh, who is in charge for such uh, repositories? Uh, the guy in the line behind you, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just talk to him after the talk. <laughs> okay, um, so it does uh, work uh, as well with all new OCI. Um, how it is, uh, what is the status of those uh, upgrades of KDE and uh, MD farm? They are partially integrated, I would say. So the uh, KDE team builds this uh, Argon and Krypton live images based on the OBS repos of KDE, and those ones are tested by OpenKA. And that is also uh, what makes KDE easy to integrate because our KDE team packages the latest KDE gets it tested by OpenKA already, so by the time that you have a stable release and it should go into town with a leap, it was already tested, the, the, the integration tests most likely pass, so it's very quickly going there. But that is kind of special to KDE because they really put effort there to integrate with the, with the testing framework. In general, OBS repos do not have this, uh, this automated testing there. That's what you only get when you are in the distribution. Any more questions? Thank you, Ludwig, for the wonderful talk on Leap. And um, the next talk will start in about five minutes. <laughs>